Yeah, by, by that time, actually, in mid-middle school, I had actually started a woodworking company uh, with, with another classmate of hold mine. On, hold yeah. on, hold on. So you, so you started a company in middle school? Is that what you said? Yeah, I okay. think it was seventh grade. We started a company, and it was, I mean, nothing major. Little end tables was probably about the biggest we were doing to start out, but little wall sconces, uh, little brackets, knickknack shelves, stuff like that. And yeah, because by that time, I had already amassed, you know, a bandsaw, an oscillating spindle sander, a table saw, um, you know, all sorts of different, you know, jigsaws and stuff. And and so I, I'd build a little knickknack shelf and then my mom's friend would want one. So I had to build another one, another one. And so finally we named the company and kind of, you know, got, got things work rolling on a paperwork end of it. And yeah, it was pretty cool. What was the name? Specialty Wooden Crafts. Welcome back to the Make or Break show, where each week we bring you stories of incredible makers and the make or break moments that have defined them along the way. I'm your host, Brandon Cullum, and this week we chat with the maker extraordinaire, Nick Ferry. Nick's projects range from shop builds, woodworking, theater sets, metal, and more. We also get into his evolution as a maker and why he stopped and came back to publishing his projects on YouTube. What is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the show. As always, we got a, another fun one for you. This week, we're chatting with the one and only Nick Ferry. And uh, before we get into that, as always, I want to let you guys know that the show is brought to you by the wonderful supporters over on Patreon. So thank you guys so much for all the support over there. If you guys would like to support the show and help us keep bringing these interviews over, then you can head over to patreon.com forward slash make or break show we are coming up on a year which is uh which is pretty crazy so thank you guys that have been along for that journey and thank you guys for the support uh one of the things you guys do get with uh the support at any level is you get an after show which is usually a few extra questions that uh we ask our guests and a lot of times those are questions that have come from you if you are a patreon supporter so if you guys would like to get your questions asked as well as getting access to the patreon feed which is like a separate podcast feed uh then you can get that at any support level but plus a bunch of other really cool stuff all right so getting into our show this week with nick you have probably seen nick's stuff definitely over on youtube if you're in the woodworking space uh his especially his crosscut slash miter sled uh, it was super and is still super popular. Uh, had nearly over 2 million views. And uh, it's a really cool design because he gets it, it, into it in the interview, but it's basically a sled that you can add different attachments to. And so uh, instead of having tons of crazy sleds all over your shop, uh, you really have one that you just drop these inserts into. And so that design really blew up. And so we get into um, not only his career in YouTube, uh, which is more recent, but also he has a super long um, just career in making, whether it's with Legos way back in the day, to uh, he was a mechanic, uh, to he was a professional welder, uh, to where he actually does some really cool theater uh, props and set builds and animatronics and all kinds of stuff. So uh, Nick's a great guy, and he's been one of those that's been around um, this kind of world for a while now. So he's able to offer some pretty cool perspective on the things that have changed, as well as the things that have changed with him and the things that he is working on now. So without further ado, let's jump into our interview with Nick. All right, guys, I want to welcome you back to the Make or Break show. We're hanging out with one and only Nick Ferry today. Uh, super excited to talk to you about all of your crazy woodworking and your crazy journey so far. But man, thank you so much for jumping on and uh, spending some time with us. Hey, no problem. My pleasure. You, you said the one and only. I'm, that's going to be a hard one to live up to. <laughs> the uh, yeah, the, the one and only Nick Ferry, whose uh, miter saw sled is probably on almost everyone's table saw right now. But uh, but man, I'm I'm excited to, to chat and to get into your your background. I was listening to uh, maybe an interview you had you had done, or it might have been on your channel. And uh, going way back, you'd mentioned that you always kind of grew up building, like that was just part of your childhood like you always kind of had tools and were working on stuff yeah I, I got started from kind of a really young age um it was i mean i was always you know one of those kids legos erector sets all sorts of stuff just wanted to create stuff and i was constantly looking at things to see kind of how they worked and yeah. what made them tick um but yeah I, I think i got my first tools as like a christmas gift from my grandparents i want to say right around age 11 okay and it was, I mean, simple. It was a, a corded drill, some drill bits, a screwdriver set, and I think like a palm sander and, and a crosscut saw, a yeah. hand saw. What did your parents think about that? 
they, my dad was indifferent. My mom <laughs> really didn't like me playing around with tools. <laughs> okay. And and now you know myself being a parent uh, to a nine and seven year old, I can I can fully understand that there's a safety concern there. But yeah. uh, the, you know the, the initial tools that I got, it's not like I was you know dealing with something super dangerous. Um, but yeah, my mom was my mom was against it and actually kind of resisted it a few different times throughout my life. Oh which, really? Yeah. You know, yeah, she's come around now. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, even go before that. So you mentioned like Legos. I, I feel like a lot of people that they get their start with building just just with that. Were there any like specific kits or like types of things that you would build with Legos? No, um, and, I, and I mean, I don't want to date myself, but I I have a feeling it was mostly like the generic, yeah, just high piece content. Okay, kits. cool. It wasn't. There weren't like the whole Star right, Wars right, right. theme sets and everything like that, and. Um, and it, when it wasn't, you know, Legos of, of any sort are kind of a pricey object and we grew up with not a lot of money. So it was pretty much hand-me-downs. I don't even think I got brand new Legos ever. Oh, really? What was the type of stuff that you had built? The, I think this is quintessential to anyone that plays with Legos, but that, that standard, what is it? Two by eight brick house. There's yeah. four walls and a door. Yeah. I think that's what every kid starts making. Yeah. Yeah. I did that one. And then I made like a pirate ship. It was like the only thing that I remember from, from way back in, but it was like all multicolored. Cause I didn't have like all the right colors and, uh, yeah, yeah that's what, all right. So you, so you got, it sounds like a, you said a corded drill and a saw and some stuff. Um, yeah. did, did you just kind of get let loose with some wood and start building or like, did you have to fight against your mom? Like, what was that? I did. I did. My, my mom, I, it didn't make much sense to me at that young of an age and it might even have been like 10, but I look back on it now and I, and I remember the look like it was yesterday. And I, I remember my mom looking at her mom cause that was my grandparents on my mother's side. And she gave her that look of like, I freaking told you not to, and you did. And she gave, gave her that look of like, Oh, well now he has some tools. Now he can go build whatever he wants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what what stuff did you start working on? Uh, the first thing I ever built, which I'm I'm very fortunate that I still have it, is a little. I would say about a six inch by four inch by maybe two inch tall box. No okay. lid, no top, no nothing. Because um, as a kid, I mean, the first thing I ever did, and that w- w- on that Christmas, I grabbed that drill, the bits, and I ran down in the basement and I chucked up a bit, and I I must have drilled fifty to hundred holes in a two by four. That's the first thing I ever did with it. <laughs> J- it was, just to drill stuff. Yeah, I mean, it was it was my drill. It was right. my bits. It was my little corner of the basement, and that just that made me happy as can be. Yeah, yeah. So, did your dad was he like? Did he have a shop? Did he work on stuff too? Or not really? Um, he was a painter. Okay. Um, the economy back in you know that day wasn't necessarily the best, and so w- working odd jobs, several jobs. Um, and I always remember him having a workbench in the basement, but it was mostly like paint pails, paint brushes, paint rollers his paint overall stuff like that uh scrapers because that was back when you had to you know scrape the paint there was no vinyl siding and, mm. and things like that but um he's actually only got my dad's only got one arm so he's not necessarily going to be the number one person to try and fit things with two hands right, right? i mean right. which is which is actually kind of amazing because he can tie his shoes with one hand and and all sorts of stuff that i would probably never be able to do but no he wasn't he never owned like a table saw or any of the bigger stuff How did your grandparents know that was something you were into? Or was it just like a shot in the dark? I probably asked them a (laughs) hundred (laughs) times. What why do you think you wanted that back then? It it was it was more of a freedom. I I had outgrown the Legos uh and the erector sets. They're 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 nice tools, they're nice, you know, kind of no pun intended, building blocks. Right. But you are limited to the amount of holes and where the holes are placed in an erector set, or you're limited to the especially when I was a kid there weren't as a wide variety of Lego pieces as, you know, my kids play with today, but you're, you're limited. You're, you're limited to the parts and pieces that are available in those type of toys. And uh, I, I wanted to drill holes in where I wanted them. I wanted to cut a piece to the length I wanted, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> did, did you do shop in high school? Did, did I get that right? Yeah, I did. And, 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 and funny story there, I actually, in middle school, even, um, and I was fortunate and that's where I earlier said that my mom had resisted at several points, but, uh, in middle school shop class, I had three different shop teachers, but I had them for each of the three years. And I was fortunate that when one of my shop teachers that I got along with the most, uh, 
when I was going from middle school to high school, he also transferred from middle school to high school. So I had him a total of seven years. I got to know that teacher and he was a large influence. In fact, my sixth grade, I think it was, my mom had called the school, talked to the shop teacher and said, I want you to get Nick out of building stuff. I don't want him around saws and things that he can cut stuff off with. And I was, like I said, super fortunate. He was like, no, he's, he's safe around the tools. We supervise, you know, it's perfectly safe. He's probably my best student in this class for that. Yeah. And uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to tell your kid not to do this. Yeah. So he, he stood up to my mom, which actually, if anyone who knows my mom, it, that takes a lot. That's crazy. So what about that shop class then? Like, what did he see in you back then? Like, were you just super interested in the stuff or... Yeah, by by that time, actually, in mid middle school, I had actually started a woodworking company uh, with with another classmate of hold mine. On, hold on, hold on. So you started a company in middle school? Is that what you said? Yeah, I okay. think it was seventh grade. We started a company, and it was, I mean, nothing major. Little end tables was probably about the biggest we were doing to start out, but little wall sconces, uh, little brackets, knickknack shelves, stuff like that. And yeah, because by that time, I had already amassed, you know, a bandsaw. An oscillating spindle sander, a table saw, um, you know, all sorts of different, you know, jigsaws and stuff. And and so I, I'd build a little knickknack shelf, and then my mom's friend would want one, so I had to build another one, another one. And so finally, we named the company and kind of, you know, got got things work rolling on a paperwork end of it. And yeah, it was pretty cool. What was the name? Specialty Wooden Crafts. <laughs> That's awesome. And you were in I, middle school. Yeah, I still had. And the funny thing, and, and looking back, I'm like, wow, just, you know, kids, I guess. But um, I actually sold stock, or at least what I thought was. <laughs> there were a couple, I, I, like at one point, I needed a bandsaw. So I, yeah. I approached everyone in school. I wrote up this little thing, and I had to get it copied on the Xerox machine. And I said, you know, if we do well uh, with your $5 investment, you'll get $7 back. If we don't do well, you might not get your money back. It was just a little promissory note. And I raised enough money to get, I think it was a bandsaw at the time for that one. Did everybody get their money back? Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Because <laughs> we actually ended up doing really good. By the time I was freshman in high school, uh, I, I was doing larger projects. Like the, I think the biggest one I had done in freshman year was like a large cherry built-in entertainment center. Back when the good tube Lord. TV, where they had yeah. to be like thirty inches deep. Good night. Uh, that's that is nuts. So was it that shop class then? Is that how you were learning, at, like, and getting your skills? Yeah, for sure. Um, but also, my I always kind of attribute my brain as to like a sponge. I was that kid that when a, a repairman would come over to fix the toilet or the dishwasher or whatever, I was that annoying kid over his shoulder going, why are you doing that? Why are yeah. you doing that? Why are you doing that? But I would actually retain it. I wasn't, you know, just annoying for the sake of being annoying, which I can also do. I'm multi-talented. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just one of those things to where, you know, I just neighbors, friends, family, anyone that you know, and, and my parents, it, looking back, it, it does look a little bit odd. Why would a 12 year old want to go hang out at a 40 year old's, you know, garage shop for five hours on a Saturday? It, yeah. it does seem a little odd, but the neighbors for the most part were like, no, no, he's good. He's just kind of helping me out with little odds and ends and just kind of, I'm teaching him a couple little things here and there. And yeah. That's cool. So was there a moment that you remember where it switched that you could sell this stuff? Like this, this could, could be a little bit more than like just my mom's friend, but like we could make something more out of this. Yeah. Once, once I had started getting, this is before social media, but once I had started getting like calls from neighbors and I'm like, Oh, is it, you know, I'd ask my mom, like, is that so? And she's like, I have, I have no idea who that is. <laughs> and I'm like, well, and, and so I, I kind of got over that, you know, it's, it's always a little awkward when you first start out in either sales or, you know, customer relations, because I, I mean, I'm an outgoing person, but, it's still weird to be, yeah. you know, 13, 14 year old talking to a 45 year old about an end table that they want built a certain way. Yeah. 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 Did anyone ever like, did you ever like go through the full process and then like they meet you and you have the product and they don't know, they didn't realize like how young you were? No, okay. not really. I wish I would have had that aha moment, but most of the times I would meet with them first. And I think Maybe that was my parents' way of saying, well, uh, you know, maybe I hope they know what they're getting into. Okay, because, cool. Yeah. You know, but I would meet with them first and kind of discuss, you know, how big, what kind of wood, you know, what kind of finish, stuff That's like cool. that. That is yeah. so great. So where does that entrepreneurial piece come from? I, I don't know. Because I the funny thing is I, I grew up in Catholic school. And when I first went to public school was when we first had lockers. Hmm. In Catholic school, we didn't have lockers. 
And so I remember being nervous about trying to figure out how a combination lock works, but that, but you could also chew gum when I went to public school. And that was like, to a kid, I was just blown away. That was the coolest thing ever. Well, my mom was a member of like a wholesale club. And so I would buy real cheap gum. And then I started selling it out of my locker and I was selling lemon heads and taffy. And so in between classes, all of a sudden I literally had this whip open locker door store. And yeah, so I've always kind of had that nature of like, how can I scrape together a couple bucks? That's funny. Cause I was about to say with with the woodworking, it sounded like you were the kid that would be selling food as well, but you were doing furniture, but it sounds like you were doing both. So you just had lots of side hustles going on it. Uh, that's, that's so, so in the high school, was it more the same? Like, did you keep like building custom furniture for people as well as doing shop? Uh, not as much as I would have liked to, um, because the, the, friend student that I started it with kind of lost interest in it. And so I would say there was a good half a year there to where I really wasn't building anything to sell. And once I got into high school, I was still kind of doing woodworking for myself and just seeing what I could make, but I wasn't necessarily selling as much of it. And I took uh, the assistant principal at my high school, took a liking to me and he was a race car driver for the sports car club of America. And I eventually ended up becoming his crew chief on his uh, race team. So I went into, you know, fixing cars and things of that nature because I was, I used to also be an automotive mechanic for oh, cool. uh, my career. So gotcha. Um, that's, that's cool. So when you got out of high school, then was it, were you going to be a mechanic? Like that was, was that your next step? Yeah, I co op my senior year of high school. I went uh, to school half the day and then a uh, mechanic half the day. Okay. And so once I was graduated from high school. Uh, I went and worked at that, uh, it was a Buick dealership and I went and worked for them full time. Yeah. 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 Uh, how long were you with them? I want to say another year and a half to two years. Okay. And and that's actually what I wanted to stick with doing. Uh, however, I, a buddy of mine was applying for a different job as a, um, a we'll call it a C-class welder. That really means nothing outside this company, but and he's like, you know, they're looking for mechanical control specialists. And I said, I don't, what the heck is that? And he goes, basically, it's like a, a piper, plumber, you know. And so I applied at that job, and it was almost triple the pay mm-hmm. that I was getting as a mechanic. And I was working flat rate, partial flat rate at the mechanic business, which for those who don't know what flat rate is, uh, you get you don't necessarily get paid hourly. You get paid, say, say a brake job takes an hour. Then you get paid an hour, whether it takes you a half hour to do it or two hours to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I doubt they pay an hour for a break job, more like eight tenths of an hour. But um, <clears throat> so, and I told, I said, can I get like a dollar an hour raise and I'll stay here? And I understand that that's still a leap, but I mean, I it was two two and a half times that is what I was offered at this manufacturing right. company, and they offered me like fifteen cents or a dime an hour raise. Uh, for flat rate. And I said, no, I said, you know, thanks, but no thanks. And so I started working in manufacturing as a, as a piper. That's cool. Did you have much welding experience when you were a mechanic or is that when you really got into that? Uh, you know, no, I, I just had a little bit from high school classes, okay. but it wasn't until I, when I went into the manufacturing space that, uh, I really started welding, uh, consistently. So when you're doing all this uh, for your day job, like, were you still building stuff on the side? Like, was that still kind of a hobby for you? Oh, definitely. Because when I was uh, a piper, uh, my wife was going to college and, you know, there's so many things that a college kid needs and doesn't have the money for. So I pretty much built her whole loft system and a little uh, bench and desk and stuff in her, her dorm room. And, and I, at that time I was renting in a duplex. And so I had roughly 600 square feet in the basement, the whole complete basement. And I was, yeah, still making stuff for people at that time. I, it's, you know, not necessarily the most fun thing to remember, but I've bought and sold so many tools over the years because of either moving or moving shops or, you know, sometimes you just need the money. And, you know, so I've had probably a half a dozen to a dozen different table saws in my life. Yeah. 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 Did, uh, for the projects you were working on then, were they always like kind of just you needed something and so that's what you worked on or were there like different types of things you really went deep into just because unless unless it was somebody wanting to buy something specific from me it was typically something that i wanted to figure out whether i was able to do it or got not. it okay um and that could be as simple as joinery and and we'll probably get to it in a little bit but uh throughout my little youtube career 
the four or five years. I don't think I'm that good of a YouTuber. I, cause I don't really care to film it. I don't care to edit it yeah. so much as I, I want to see if I can make it or build it or try it joinery finish, whatever. And then once I did that, my mind is satisfied. I want to move on to something right, else right, right. and turn to a computer and start editing. That's cool. Uh, has there been something that you have learned that, uh, especially like in that, in that phase where it was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. Like what, what's been kind of the most intimidating thing f- from the get go that you've had to go into? Probably it's hard to say. There's probably a few of them, but probably finding the right customers to where it didn't drive me crazy. I, I never wanted to do the woodworking as kind of a day job, nine to five, you know, my career because it was so much fun to me. I didn't want to be on a production line making cabinet carcasses. I didn't want to, you know, being a uh, finish shop sanding on a on a DA all day. It's it's so finding the right customer that wasn't like the arts and crafts. You know, I did the arts and crafts shows for years, and I got sick of batching out stuff. Uh, then I started doing the, the more of a commission pieces, but then the customers were wanting to almost order a la carte to where I want this wood, I want it this tall, and you know, I want it this finish, I want this color, I want this, and. I had no freedom. I was just basically building their dreams. So I, I, right. I wanted to build what I wanted to build. And so it was hard to find customers that, that want to buy what you want to make. Yeah. 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 So when, so when was this, when you were, uh, when you were doing the welding with, with piping? Like uh, how, how long ago? About two, two and a half years out of high school. Okay. Gotcha. So how long, yeah. how long were you doing that? Uh, five, six years, I think. Jeez. Okay, cool. So what was uh, that next step then? Uh, that's shortly after the economy kind of tanked. It was shortly after 9-11. Gotcha. And the company I worked for, uh, the, the products that they made were not necessarily, um, they were an upgrade to, in the paper making realm, paper making and paper printing, uh, a company could get by with the equipment they currently had, but the, cur- the, the equipment that we were selling was more efficient. So in a bad economy, it was one of those to where it's not in the budget to be buying a bunch of new equipment. So the, and that company was notorious for layoffs and it was a, a union shop uh, based on seniority and I was fairly low on the totem pole. So I was one of the first people to go. Gotcha. Gotcha. So where, uh, where'd you go next? Um, I, well, I had almost a year off cause I, I got in a motorcycle accident and mm. broke my neck and my back. Oh geez. Okay. Yeah. So I had, uh, uh, about a year off, there was rehabil- uh, rehabilitation and all that stuff, physical therapy. And so I went back to wrenching on cars and at a Chrysler dealership. And it wasn't long after I realized my back was not putting up with that. I'm To be a flat rate mechanic, I quite frankly, I'm not that good of a mechanic. Uh, if you're really good, you can make 80 hours pay in 40 hours. Yeah. Uh, me, I was just some weeks scraping by to make 40, 45 hours in a 40 hour work week. So that's not necessarily conducive to a, a good wage. And obviously the, the, those dealerships, they want to put a flat rate tech in that will produce the most amount of work in that stall as possible. So there was always this kind of nudge to hurry up. It's, it's a longer story. I had, I had bosses at one time that were younger than me that knew nothing about cars. That's frustrating right. to have that kind of hierarchy in a, in a workplace environment. But yeah, so I, I went back to wrenching on cars and then uh, I, I quit that shortly after. So when, so you mentioned YouTube, when did you even think that was something that you'd want to get into? Um, I I was watching a lot of YouTube stuff, uh, mostly woodworking. Uh, I grew up watching like Norm Abram of the new Yankee workshop, uh, Bob Vila, uh, this old house, all sorts of those PBS style programming. And, and I, and I always enjoyed that. And so I, I gravitated rather quickly to YouTube. And I was watching a lot of YouTube stuff even before signing up for an account. Uh, I never commented. I never could like or sh- subscribe or any of that stuff. But um, my wife kind of took it like, hey, you know, you watch enough of this stuff. She knows quite a bit about woodworking, I would say more so than, than your average spouse. And she knew I had a, a theater cart, or at least that's what I called it, coming up. And it was going to be a, a fairly in-depth build. She said it was really cool. She's like, you know what? You, you've, you've been toying around with the idea of trying to film something and throw it on YouTube to see if anyone has any interest for quite some time. It was almost a year. 
She goes, why don't you? Why don't you film it? Maybe you never edit it. Maybe you never even take it off the memory card, but it's going to be a cool build. You might as well film it. That way you at least have it because you're going to kick yourself if you build this thing and you don't get any documentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that the so, was that the styrofoam, like the brick and stone? Looks like like your second video that looks like it's a um, theater piece or is it something different you're talking about? It, it's something different. It's still theater related, okay. but uh, no, there was a, it was a theater workstation. A oh, work oh gotcha. Yeah, a big black bohemoth thing where I could transport my tools because uh, years ago I started helping out on theater sets and building theater sets and full finishes and uh, different textures, different mixed media and stuff like that. And so I needed somewhere to bring my tools quickly and keep them out of the way when they have rehearsals, lock them up at night. And so that was, you know, that birthed the idea of my theater cart. And that was my first video I ever filmed, but it wasn't the first one I ever released. Got it. Got it. Uh, so even before, I guess, YouTube, um, how did you get into the theater, like the set design stuff? Uh, a friend of mine, and, and I could talk for hours on this one, so hopefully I don't get too wordy, interrupt me. At no, any no, no, time. you're fine. <laughs> uh, a buddy of mine was, he's always been into theater, and I met him in the manufacturing space. He was he was a painter when I was a piper, and he would, uh, this was like a, a lacquer, a catalyzed uh, industrial finish. And so they had to then start pumping lacquer or solvent through, and he had to clear the lines. These lines were like three-eighths inch and like 50 feet long. So almost two minutes of constant spraying paint. And most guys would just spray it into a, a dump bucket and then have it, you know, he would paint murals on the back of the, the paint booth. Hmm. And so I gravitated towards that. I've always liked artistic people. I took art class, you know, college level art classes. Oh, cool. I was like 13 or 14. Um, and so I, you know, became friends with him and he's like, Oh, I, yeah, I also do theater set painting and full finish and, and so we became friends. And in fact, he's, he's, you know, to this day, he stood up at my wedding. He's a um, godfather, of one of my kids, you know, it's, um, and, but yeah, I'd help him paint. And then people were like, wow, you could build this, you could build that. And I said, yeah, I've built stuff like that. And so then I got into the, the theater set building and prop building and stuff. That's so cool. What's that world like for people that may be more familiar with like building like shop furniture or building furniture for the house? But is there is it still kind of the same mindset when you're going into building things for theater or, or is it like a different kind of approach you got to take? I think it's a completely different approach okay. and, and, and a lot and many times more fun because in theater you work with so many different materials and you make certain materials look like other materials. Like you had mentioned that, that foam castle I had done. And that was for the Shrek the Musical. And uh, they wanted kind of a, a little bit of a cinder block look in this big tower. Well, they didn't have the budget or the means in which to actually build a big cinder block tower. So I built a, you know, a structural wood frame and then clad it in styrofoam and made it look like cinder block. And so it's, it's a lot of it's a different mindset in theater, but it's a heck of a lot of fun because. You know, uh, I'm, I'm working on a, a piece right now for uh, It's a Wonderful Life, and uh, that opens in December. So I got about roughly two months to build it. But I was working on, like, say, the rivets to the bridge. And the bridge, yes, is structural, but it's like two by tens. Right. And so what, what are you going to mimic the, once it's painted to look like rivets? And I, li I like using those little those little black and white googly eyes, oh, yeah. you know, that they craft. They make those anywhere down to a quarter inch in diameter all the way up to, you know, 12 inches in diameter. And those make you pop a couple of those on in a pattern. By the time you paint it, it looks like the heads of rivets on a bridge. That's cool. That's so cool. Yeah. What's uh, what's your favorite build from for, for, for theater? theater? Yeah. Um, probably when I did Noises Off. And if anyone's familiar with Noises Off, it's very much a comedy based on uh, visual comedy, physical comedy, where there's like nine or ten doors, people falling downstairs, and the first act you get to see the front of the house where the audience normally would. And then the second act, the whole theater set needs to spin 180 oh, degrees cool. okay. because they repeat the first act, but now you see it from behind the scenes as the actors would see. Yeah. It. And I helped out. I wasn't lead on that one, but I helped out building this big revolving two and a half story. Um, and it, and it swiveled on, I think we had like 60 or 70 casters under it. It took three guys, you know, pretty much all their effort. And the proscenium is the, the amount of opening on the stage walls. Okay. And by the time we got done spinning it, we had two inches on either side Jeez. to actually spin. And it wasn't it wasn't anchored in place. Per that theater, we weren't able to anchor it in place. Wow, so you had to be real precise with those guys moving. Very, yeah, yeah. It was it was a fun one though. And 
that director did a really great job and that director cast a really great cast and that the play was probably one of the most memorable ones I've even seen. So and luckily I was, I was a part of help making it happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So is it the same theater or same company that you work for mostly for that stuff? No. Um, I do anywhere from I've done as, as young as, uh, like middle school theater groups, uh, high school, college, uh, local nonprofits, community theaters, okay. stuff like that. So I would say, maybe anywhere from two dozen to 30 different theater groups I've done work for over the years. That's cool. And is it mostly in like in your area that you work? Yeah, okay. nor- mostly Northeast Wisconsin. Okay. Um, we do have a couple nice theaters. We have like the Widener Center at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. We have the Fox Valley Performing Arts Center, uh, which isn't but maybe a half hour, 35 minutes from me. Um, a couple nice for, you know, for the eater, for the area, I would say decent in the arts program. Gotcha. That's cool. Did uh, so also said that you do animatronics or you've done animatronics? Yeah, right? I uh, was that through theater that was, as well. Yep, okay. that was uh, uh, the one I can remember that was they really raved about. They really enjoyed the the animatronics was for the play uh, uh, Blythe Spirit. Okay, and one of the scenes calls for a ghost that you can't see to pick up a pillow and throw it at her still living husband, and. So I, I rigged up and I designed this kind of breakaway arm and a pneumatic uh, linear actuator hooked up to a solenoid and a drill battery. And I buried all that stuff in the couch and kind of made a catapult and then outfitted the pillow with kind of a platform and this breakaway hinge to where when the pillow got to the extent of the catapult, it would break away. And this so this pillow just basically just just left the couch, launched and hit the actor. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, it was very cool. And in that same play, they had a, a scene where the ghost was supposed to come to this pedestal table and open and, and close and slam shut some drawers. And the, the director was very uh, stern on, I don't want any lines, cords, anything running to this table. I want I want people to see that you pick the table up and, that, you know, it, I want to, I want to really sell that effect. Yeah. And so I built in these little air reserves and I had to make them so that they match the curvature of the table. And then there was a linear actuator in there as well. And I just, I wire that to um, like a remote car start, like an accessory 12 volt, you know, on off. And then I just got a a 12 volt uh, solenoid. And so, yeah, and because that's what I did in in manufacturing. I did all sorts of piping and plumbing, uh, gas lines, pneumatic stuff, uh, copper, mild steel, stainless steel. So I was formally trained in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you are given like a problem like that to solve like what's your approach look like are you or or even even now like are you going to paper are you working stuff out on the computer are you just toying with stuff in your workshop um i'm i'm a i I like jotting things down i constantly and it's probably bad for organizational reasons and if i was able to scan it in some program that'd probably be better but i tend to jot things down it depends If, if it's a commissioned piece to where somebody wants me to uh build them something the first two questions I always ask, and this is the best advice that I can ever give anyone building something for money, uh, budget and turnaround time. You have to agree on those two things first and foremost. If you cannot agree on both, there's no sense in wasting anyone else's time. And you know, if you're not going to agree on price, well, then n- nothing to go forward. If, if you agree on the price and, and you have you know a month to do it, but it's going to take you two months, so you can't, uh, then there's no point in talking anymore either. So in, in a commission aspect, that's the first thing I do is you know price and turnaround for theater stuff i i, I kind of simplify this in my head but where am i at where do they want to be at and then i just connect the dots yeah yeah, yeah. And, and it sounds like well sometimes with the the bigger in-depth projects that that's quite the leap to make sure well then pick a middle point and say you know where do i need to be at this point and and that's kind of the neat thing too about theater it it almost forces you to be creative because a lot of these nonprofit right. theater groups don't have large budgets. So like right now that bridge that I'm working on, it's going to be structurally sound because actors need to, it needs to bear weight and needs to, and I'm going to going for right around a 50 to 60 uh, pounds per square foot live load as far as the structure, but I want it to look like I beams. Well, to add wood to it, it costs a lot of money. So I'm going to add foam to, to do the, the top and bottom plates of an I beam so that, yeah, the two by 10 will be the structure. But the foam, and it'll get painted right along with it, so it'll look like it one piece, but it'll look like an I-beam. 
uh, especially theater, it feels like you get like these really cool, like hard parameters that you got to work around. So like it forces you to have those like super creative ideas versus like a really big budget and all these different tools and materials you can use. So, um, yeah, I cool. mean, the, the parameters. Yeah, you're right. They, they can be pretty hard pressed sometimes. But that's where I think that you get the creative freedom because they're not telling you. They're like, yes, it's got to support human weight and it's got to look like a bridge. They're not telling me I have to use foam. Right. They're not telling me I have to use Luan. They're not telling me, you know, I, what I have to use for the rivets or even where the rivets need to be. Or so, I, and so I get photo references and and I go on Google Images and I type truss bridges and uh, you know suspension bridges and I just kind of get components that I, I want to create and I'll just sketch them down real quick and typically pass it by the director and say, hey, in fact, I'm meeting with that director for that play um, this afternoon, but. Um, to go over pre preliminary drawings I, that I sketched up. But. That's cool. Uh, all right, so going back to, to YouTube, um, so you have that uh, video films uh, and then you, you put it online. Uh, was it, how quickly did you decide this is something like I want to put some, some time and effort into? I don't know, because the first project I, I did was, was with my oldest boy, and we built a little bird feeder, and I edited that one together, and I, I wanted that to be my first video. I didn't want it to be, I don't know, it just, it seemed more, I don't know, it's fairy tale ending story, you know, I don't know, it's just yeah. for whatever reason, it was just in, in my mind that, hey, build something with your kid, that'd be, that'll be, a, that'll be a cool first thing, yeah. it'll be a kind of a time capsule, he'll be able to look back at that, and uh, you know, and so that video didn't get many views, which I didn't, I didn't think any videos would really get any views, but that theater cart, I think it's even currently up to like 300,000 views. And I want to say six months in, it had half that. Yeah. And I was just beside myself. <laughs> yeah. I was like, are you kidding? That is crazy. I was thinking maybe maybe 50 to 100 people would check it out. Right. And it yeah, to get 10 times that. And so that's when I had, I had at least you know, kind of took notice. I'm like, "Well, what else could I show that people would like that I think they would, you know, what else am I working on that I think is kind of cool?" Did uh yeah. did that influence your like future projects? Like I know we I've brought in some some people and like they're having to think through like these are gonna be things that people are gonna find interesting. Like so I'm gonna work on this project to hopefully get like higher views and the money that comes from all that. But has that ever kind of influenced your potential projects or has it always been kind of something just you're interested in and so you work on it? I wouldn't I wouldn't say that the YouTube <laughs> You know, truth be told, I, I I can really care less about the views and the subscriber numbers. In fact, it I took like eight months off from making videos because I found myself chasing these stupid numbers. Right. It was it made no sense. Uh, I I did it to have some fun, see if people had some interest. That's why I started it. So that's why I should continue to do it. And I'm sitting there. You know, I found myself sitting there like two hours a day crunching numbers, and I'm like, I'm not an actuary. I'm not a CPA. Why am I sitting here? you know, trying to crunch all these numbers, I should just go build what, whatever I want. My problem is I don't always know how to show what I'm building. Gotcha. Some of the stuff is, you know, some of the theater stuff especially has deadlines and you're really not in the director's good graces if you stop everything you're doing to set up a tripod and, and set up a camera. And yeah, you could set one up with a time lapse or something in the corner, but I don't, I don't think that makes for an interesting video. Right, right. So, uh, one video I'm sure most people will be familiar with, it, it seems like it's about a year after you started was your, your cross cut slash miter sled, that, that combo. When you were working on that yeah. project, did you know this was something that a lot of people probably are going to be interested in? Or was it just, again, something you were, you just wanted to work on? I figured people would like that because I had never in my entire life seen somebody combine a miter sled and a cross cut sled. And I had had that idea for years. Yeah. And I didn't want to stick the energy and effort into making it until I knew I was going to have a table saw that I was going to have for quite some time. So it was just one of those, I had always in years past, just slapped together these real quick crosscut sleds, it beat the heck out of them. You know, they, they got tossed around, some got thrown out, but the idea behind that was why I've had miter sleds, I've had tenoning jigs, I've had mitered spline jigs, I've had crosscut sleds, I've had all these different jigs over the years, and they take up so much room. Yeah. 
And you're always spending time trying to figure out the runners, whether you want to go with plastic runners or HDPE runners or hardwood runners or metal runners. And so I'm like, why can't I build a base that every other table saw jig that I ever make will attach to? And and I started with the miter sled insert. So it's a miter sled and a crosscut sled in one. Yeah. And then shortly after, I made a tenoning jig that attached to it that makes like pretty much perfect tenons. But then you flip it around 180 degrees, and it also makes mitered splines. Yeah, that's cool. So, I yeah, I figured people would like it, but I had no. I think it's over two million views now. Yeah, yeah. I, no, no clue that it would. I figured because at that time, I think I wanted this. I want to say I was getting like twenty thousand views a video. Okay. I'm like, oh, the, I'll have no problem getting the twenty thousand. I'm sure people like it. people like shop stuff. You know, and but I built it because I I had been waiting forever, and I finally bought the saw that I figured I'd have for quite some time. So I was quick to pull the trigger on making it. That's cool. Did it? Was it one of those that just took off, like right when you placed it? Yeah, it. I don't know. See, that's going back to the numbers that I really don't look at anymore. Um, so I wouldn't have a good answer, but I want to say it kind of roller coaster, but always stayed high in views. Gotcha. Gotcha. Like there's plenty of videos I've done to where, yeah, yeah, you'll get your initial views and then they just taper off. And I, I always call the video, it, it is the videos dying, you know, the video died and, you know, maybe there's five views a day on that video all of a sudden, you know, for here on out, um, that video never seemed to die. So I, I guess people liked it. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Uh, so you said you, you took a break for a little bit uh, and that was fairly recently, right? Yeah, I pretty much only came back uh, like three, two, three months ago. Yeah, because I, I feel like I, I saw your stuff starting to pop back up, and I'm like, wait a minute, I haven't seen like one of his videos in a while. And then I had to go back to your feed, and it's like, oh, yeah. he hasn't posted in a while. So, what was the that motivation for for coming back? Uh, just because I was able to clear my head and not look at the numbers. Um, I would. It started. It morphed. It quickly morphed for me, and I can I can see how it does yeah. because it goes it goes to people's heads, you know that. Oh wow! A bunch of subscribers, a bunch of views, a bunch of numbers, and you know how can I, uh, you know, analyze them? To, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not into analyzing numbers. I don't really want to crunch numbers. I don't want to look at SEO and tags. And I'm not a super computer savvy individual. I really, am, I'm not. And so it just became taxing. And I said, you know, whatever. I'm gonna, I'm going to go out to my shop. I'm going to make whatever I make on a normal basis. And I'm just not going to film it. And I'm just going to you know, move on with my life. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I decided to come back and I'm like, you know what, maybe I'll show this, that here and there. Uh, if I do great, if I don't great, but I'm, I'm going to really stop looking at the numbers. That's cool. So now as far as I guess your, your day job or how you're bringing in income, is it just a lot of kind of commission pieces and is it like just a bunch of different ways that like you make a living now? Um, yeah, it's a, a multitude of different ways in which, and the funny thing is my wife really hates that. She's, she's not an entrepreneur. Um, she's, she's like, she likes that steady right, paycheck, yeah. that nine to five kind of punch clock routine, which is completely acceptable. But me, I've always been, uh, ever since, like I said, I started selling gum in school. And I, I'm always able to scrape a couple bucks together and yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'll, I'll sell a couple smaller pieces here and there. I'll do some theater set builds. Um, I silk screen all my own t-shirts okay. and I've, I've done that for years. Um, Cause most of these theater groups, when they have a play uh, with, with the actors and the stage crew and, and everyone behind the scenes, you're, t- you're typically talking 50 to 60 people. Well, for a while there, every single play from multiple theater houses were ordering like 60 shirts at a pop. So that was, you know, that was all right money coming in. Um, I used uh, years ago, I owned a sign company. So people are constantly st- still from that business asking, Hey, can you make this sign? Can you make this decal? Can you make this vehicle graphic? And I still have a couple plotters and stuff. And I still do that on a regular basis. Gotcha. That, that makes sense for people that do want to check out your stuff. And if for whatever reason they haven't, uh, nickferry.com, is that the best place that you would send people? Yeah, that's, and, and that's got all the links. Uh, I'm, I'm most active on Instagram just because it's easy for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Post a picture or video and write a sentence about it. But, uh, you know, I also got a Facebook stuff and Twitter and, yeah. Or as I tell my wife, Facebook, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, man, well, thank you so much for, for chatting with me and taking the time. It's Absolutely. A blast. Totally my pleasure, man.